So the title of this session is The Future of Trade Unions, but I will um, start linking it to your session of uh, two weeks ago. The, the ending of your session was quite pessimist, or at least negative in the description of our work environment. And to a question, are we happy at work? We appear to be answering, uh, not really, for a series of uh, reasons that you very well listed, uh, from uh, uh, work intensification uh, to uh, stress uh, to less uh, discretion at work, uh, and uh, as a reaction, as a consequence of this bubble that burst with COVID and with uh, possibly also Brexit, uh, people are starting uh, resigning. We see difficulties in uh, recruitment, uh, in uh, retention. And we also see probably problems of engagement. You define these as a new frontier of dealing with engagement. Uh, people which are just ready to leave in the meantime, doing as little as possible. Overall, uh, people not being happy at work. So starting from this, uh, I will adopt a slightly different perspective, a more employment relations perspective, and I will add a few aspects to, to, your, um, to your analysis. And I will uh, mention conflict, trade unions, voice, involvement, and participation. And in this context, I will, uh, I will try to answer the question, is there a future for trade unions? Uh, but before the future, let's start uh, with the past. I've seen a kind of complacency in dealing with the union as if this was doomed to be a relic of the past. And also as if it is not part of our traditions. The trade union is a very British institution. It's not an import product. It's not alien to our culture. We invented the modern trade unions. And even if there were laborers associations in the Roman Empire, in the Greek republics, and of course, uh, um, corporations and associations in the Middle Age, the modern trade unions uh, was invented in England uh, during the uh, first industrial revolution. So it belongs to us. Uh, and uh, we can refer to Manchester, the first meeting uh, of the TUC in 1868 in the Institute of Mechanics. Uh, when Marx and Engels were still around. I can refer to the book 1894, The History of Trade Unionism by Sidney and Beatrice Webb, who, by the way, were also prominent actors of the academic, political, and cultural life of England, uh, being uh, founding members or members of the Labour Party, of the Fabian Society, of the London School of Economics. So this is a part of our story. Now, we tend to look at the membership levels and we take for granted that uh, they're going down and down and down, and uh, this means the end of trade unions. But I will argue later that uh, it doesn't matter the membership level. The membership level is uh, irrelevant in judging how powerful a union is, uh, how conflictual a union is, uh, what's the role of a union. If we look at Europe, the membership level tells us zero. Uh, but anyway, let's, let's see the membership levels. A first outlook would tell us that uh, this is going down and down, but in fact, we have, uh, we have reached now a plateau and I expect this plateau not to be breached. And in fact, uh, if we zoom, we see that uh, 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019 have been years of membership going up. Then of course the pandemic arrives, unemployment, furlough scheme. So 20 and 21, we see again a little decline but maybe when in late spring we have the 2022 uh, figures, there might be uh, a new surprise. But anyway, as I said, membership is not everything we should look at. Uh, something more important to look at is uh, conflict. So is conflict gone? Because if conflict is not gone and trade union is gone, we, we have lost a tool to deal with conflict and to deal with the problems that Nick described last week. So let's see if conflict is gone. I think not entirely. Uh, of course, we are not in 1998, the Welsh Coast Strike with 15 million of days lost. We are nowhere close to the 20s or the 30s, the Black Friday of 1921, we did 85 million or days lost, 
the general strike, 162 million of days lost, and also we are not anywhere close to the 70s and the 80s. The strike, the minus strike, 53 million, winter of discontent, 1979, and the Battle of Orgrave, 1884, with 20, still 27 million. If we jump to uh, to this decade and the previous decade, we are talking about very little number of of days lost because of strike. Still, we remember the 2011 public sector strikes and then 2012, 2014. Now, in the past three years, four years, we have seen new developments in terms of industrial disputes. But my argument is that this decline of days lost because of strike is not answering my question, is conflict gone? Because conflict is not only Measure by, measurable by the simplest measure, which is the strike days. We have to look at uh, other indicators. For example, if I show you the individual disputes which are registered in our employment tribunals, they've been going up since the 70s. So the, the, it is as if uh, the conflict has moved from the collective uh, manifestations to the individual sphere. Many more uh, do not reach the tribunal because they stop shortly before, and many more conflicts at individual level still happen, and we can, we can look for, for this type of conflict in, um, in those signs. Lack of engagement is a sign of conflict. Fight quitting is, is a sign of conflict. Low morale, absenteeism, pilfering, working without uh, regard is a sign of conflict. Complaints, but even the extensive use of fractional con uh, contracts is a sign of uh, something not going well. And of course, the discipline and the grievance procedure. And also the, 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 the stress leave can also be seen uh, from this viewpoint. By the way, if we go to Europe, uh, strikes uh, have been there also in the past decades, uh, usually a bit more uh, violent than here. And uh, this is a famous case of uh, 2015 uh, with the head of HR of a France that was um, uh, had to leave a meeting with the with the, 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 the work councils of uh, France, and they basically had to start running. And the the trade union started pulling his cloth off, and he ended half naked at the border of the French um, um, headquarter of uh, France, being. Uh, thrown on the other side of the fence towards the police by his security. This, is, this was a, a, likely not tragic, but a bit, a bit funny. Why this is happening? Why we still have uh, strikes and uh, all sorts of forms of conflict? For example, because the perception of inequality has been going up and the perception of injustice has been going up. And uh, surprisingly, a book which is very heavy became a world bestseller. And uh, it's not only about inequality, but also about injustice. So the perception that uh, people are richer than us or uh, they get a higher income than us, not only because they work better or not necessarily because they work better than, us, better than us or because they have studied more or because they are smarter, but because of uh, reasons that we can associate to injustice. And from, from the political point of view, this also gave uh, um, the, this explains the success of the populist parties in, in the Western world in the past decade. So inequality and injustice. Inequality work-wise, we can measure it uh, um, like um, the labor share in macroeconomic terms, or in this diagram, you see the share of income going to the top 10%. Strangely, this is perfectly symmetrical to the decline of union membership, union know, membership going down and inequality going up. This is the United States. I got the same figures for the UK. Uh, there's no uh, causality here, but uh, still it's interesting to, to observe those two trends being perfectly symmetrical. To some extent, uh, we are observing the failure of the promise of the human resource management paradigm. In the 90s, we were told that you don't need any longer the unions because our super sophisticated tools, first systems, first procedures, rationalized mechanisms will make sure that there is no injustice at work. There might be some 
pay dispersion more than in the past, but this pay dispersion is justified by um, different levels of contribution, skills, and talents. And we, uh, we, we allow this pay dispersion to happen uh, because uh, there is perfect rationality in dealing with it. But after all, there are signs that uh, this was not the case. Well, first of all, uh, salaries uh, have been going much slower than productivity. Not that productivity uh, went so well, but salaries went very bad in real terms. And also, many problems were not solved at all by human resource management. Uh, gender pay gap is still here. So how can we justify, um, uh, how, how can we explain that this is here despite the, the, the perfectly rational and fair uh, systems introduced by human resource management? Not surprisingly, conflict is back also in the UK and union mediated conflict, not only that individual forms of conflict that I mentioned earlier, be them employment tribunals or forms of lacking in engagement. And of course, we are not going to see the characters of the 70s and the 80s, and this is gone forever probably. And we, we can even be happy because we live in a more peaceful uh, society and so uh, more peaceful labor markets and employment uh, sphere is uh, to some extent a sign of our society being less conflictual. Nevertheless, uh, um, something is happening. You know, until now we had even in the artistic representation of um, um, trade unionism, a kind of melancholy as if, uh, again, this was a relic of the past, something gone forever. But after all, it is still alive. Maybe the picket lines are quieter, maybe they are smaller, but they've been uh, consistently active in many sectors. And uh, in this activism of uh, recent um, uh, events, we also saw uh, new, new trade union leaders emerging and emerging as very capable, cap very capable of dealing uh, with the negotiation tables and dealing with the media, dealing with the press, dealing with the political sphere. And uh, this might be an interesting uh, development for the future. Let's see what this will bring. At this point, not only the unions, but everybody else should be asking, uh, is the British system of industrial relations still fit for purpose? Maybe not necessarily. And I will try to, uh, to, to see why not? And I will try to mention what would be the alternatives. The, the current situation here is that we have very low collective bargaining coverage, relatively low, but not super low uh, uh, union membership. Still weak unions, a unitarist management style as the dominant ideology, a, a legislation which, which is still about voluntarism in industrial relations, no state intervention, no tripartite relations, rejection of the European social dialogue model, weak employees associations, and overall a conflict oriented approach. Um, to some extent, we, we believed that, that the rest of the world was uh, converging towards us or towards the Anglo-American model. So we assume that Germany, France, uh, Sweden would have moved towards us. And this was um, theorized by, by a section of the literature in, the, in sociology work and economics about the so-called trajectory towards the neoliberal model. But this didn't happen so quickly as forecasted, or at least it's not happened entirely yet. Even the study by Guglielmo Meardi from Warwick University didn't show this truly quick and uh, permanent convergence towards the, the, the Anglo-American model. So the diversity within European uh, traditions uh, persists and we have not seen everybody moving towards our model. So in fact, now the question is, shall we move in uh, the direction of uh, some alternatives? And this will be my point today. Even in the United States, uh, the unions have not disappeared after all, and now there is a little revival even there, or at least an attempt of revival. Uh, last year, uh, Biden gave a beautiful speech in occasion of the attempt to unionize the Alabama plant of Amazon. It almost succeeded, but still it was, even if it failed, it was uh, the occasion of a great debate, political level, intellectual level, level and also short floor level on whether we need a union or not. 
and in this section of his speech, very short but uh, powerful, he said that the National Labor Relations Act was not just to allow employees uh, to join a union and to ask for recognition. It was uh, thought, it was designed to, 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 to foster a collective uh, industrial relations system where employees and employers engage through, through collective bargaining negotiations. And uh, um, it was, um, well, uh, even in the United States, uh, we might see some surprises. Going back to a film, uh, I would like to mention this documentary of uh, a couple of years ago, American Factory. This is about uh, not only the cultural clash between the Chinese capitalism and the American capitalism, but it's also about uh, the revival of the interest on um, trade unionism in, uh, in, in American Factory, in this case, in Detroit. Uh, now, to, to make some concrete examples of alternatives, I would like to mention two fairy tales, two uh, strange uh, cases, if you wish, from our point of view. We are in a very far away place, uh, very far away from here. This is a strange country with uh, a powerful union, which is not conflictual. And it's a very productive country, and it is a relatively peaceful society, and uh, it has been going fast, and is a, a powerful nation after all. In this country, uh, very productive, uh, export-led economy, uh, the employee representatives are allowed, in particular by law, to be uh, sitting at board level. So employee representation happens at the very top level of the governance of, of medium to large corporations. And they have, in this faraway country, they have 30, 50% of the seats uh, of this uh, supervisory board. And um, so you might think, what, what is this? Cuba, what is this? Uh, China, what is this? Uh, the Soviet Union, no. This is a very, after all, not that far away country, very productive uh, Western uh, nation. I'm referring to, to, to contemporary Germany, not to the, to the democratic uh, German Republic, where we have perfectly successful companies, still powerful union, and this union is embedded in the governance of the companies and is harmony oriented, it is perfectly interested in the competitiveness of, of the company and actively push for more productivity and more competitiveness because uh, the union is aware that uh, this is in the interest of the employees and the workers uh, agree with this and the employers agree with this and are perfectly happy of this type of win-win cooperation between management and unions. And they even do this uh, in other nations where there isn't the Mittmestimung uh, German uh, uh, constitutional law uh, outside the German legal environment, they still do this. They still do this uh, uh, in, uh, in the European and uh, overseas plans, uh, and they do even do voluntary um, agreements with the global unions at global level. So they do uh, export these uh, industrial relations uh, tradition even outside Germany, even where this is not required, and, to, and they set standards which are above the, the liberal standards of the countries where they operate. So in the classification of typologies of industrial relations system, Germany is there, powerful union, but harmony-oriented system, and uh, very successful, very successful case. It's not, it's not perfect, but uh, to some extent, a very, very interesting case. Second story. Not to always mention the same countries, uh, we always talk about Germany, Sweden, uh, but there is much more in Europe uh, work-wise in terms of uh, interesting approaches to dealing with employees with, uh, and their representatives. This is another fairy tale, another country far away from here, far, far away. A country with a union which is um, equally powerful, but more conflictual. And it is not harmony oriented necessarily like in Germany, it is a bit more conflictual and uh, collective bargaining, the, the collective bargaining coverage is a slightly lower. Membership is not that different uh, to the British one. And uh, also here, there is state intervention in the economy. And um, I tell you a couple of uh, interesting things about this country. 
uh, during the pandemic, even, even there, in this place far away, the, the pandemic, uh, the employees didn't just say, you go back to work, you go back to teach in class, in the factory, whatever, we decide how uh, and, and when. At, at uh, industry level, and then at company level, they were assigned between management and unions, safety protocols, with also the presence of an independent actor, which was a medical expert, on how to make sure that the operations were starting again in, in a safe way. Not only in a safe way, but in a way which was perceived as safe by the workers, because the unions were signing those protocols, were signing those agreements, were negotiating the, the, the way forward to deal with the pandemic. And I'm referring to the first, the second wave of uh, 2020. So before the vaccination, when everybody was still panicking. So this is a highly uh, manufacturing country, export-led industries, um, and uh, you're gonna move them uh, at home because it was the people that requ were required to work in, in a factory. But this, this uh, emergency was negotiated with the unions. Well, uh, I referred to Italy, to my own country, which is the second largest manufacturing country in Europe. Uh, the union in the public sector is, is not particularly, um, um, let's say, functional. There are many problems. But in the private sector, in the export-led sector, in the sectors where there is more competition, the union operates, as in the, in the German case, uh, in signing agreements at national level and then a company level that are perfectly compatible with productivity levels going up, uh, simultaneously improving the working conditions. I'll give you an example. This is the pharmaceutical sector. We beat even Germany in pharmaceutical production. This was the case in the past five years. And this is a highly unionized sector, highly unionized. So you've got not one, but you have maybe five unions in some of those factories. Everybody agrees uh, national level contracts, and most of those factories then agree a company level contract, which is some parliamentary, not alternative to the national level, with additional benefits uh, and uh, working conditions going uh, uh, even, uh, also improving if the, the, the standards are met. And uh, it is exactly in those sectors with unions and company level bargaining that you see more productivity, but also better salaries better safety conditions, more training, more overall employment. So a very good uh, story also here in the, in the, in the industries, which are, uh, let's say, um, export oriented. So that have to deal with the international competition within Italy. This is an example of the safety protocols uh, that were signed during the pandemic in, at the beginning of uh, 2020. This is the case of Ferrari, but you had everywhere, universities in, uh, um, food uh, services, uh, hospitality. At national level, the unions and the employees association sign an agreement. And then at company level, in many cases, there was an additional safety protocol signed to deal with the specificities of that plant. Because of course, the, the Ferrari plant is different to the Fiat plants and the Fiat plant X is different to the Fiat plant Z. And the company level uh, collective bargaining has proved very successful in many respects. And, and again, not as an alternative, but as an addition to the um, sector level negotiations. Now, uh, back to Britain, what are the renewal options for trade unionism here? Well, there are, I think there are many. First of all, uh, nevertheless, we need to uh, be aware that it uh, doesn't depend only on, uh, on the unions. And you can get uh, another 10 million of uh, union members, but this doesn't mean that there will be more collective bargaining in Britain, because uh, um, collective bargaining in France is 90%, despite 10% of the uh, membership coverage, because it is the legislation, and because it is the state, and because it is the employers that uh, uh, are willing to engage in collective bargaining. So it's not the membership that will transform um, the, 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 the British system, but equally, um, this also means that we don't need to worry about the current level of membership because uh, um, this is perfectly compatible with any of the other um, alternative model uh, being currently in place in Europe. So collective bargaining to, to become more functional here and to a more widespread needs the willingness of the other actors. 
um, because there is no link between membership level and power of the unions. This is true in every European nation, which is a patchwork of different combination of uh, figures and, and rules. By the way, membership is not is also not the only funding membership, funding mechanism for unions in Europe. Many unions are powerful and rich in Europe, despite low membership levels. They, they find money in alternative ways, and I will mention a couple of, of them later. Finally, we shouldn't be worried of more, of more membership, and we shouldn't be worried of, of more powerful unions, because more powerful union doesn't necessarily means, mean more conflictual union. We have, we have unions in Europe which are small and more conflictual, or big and less conflictual. It doesn't need to be this like this. In fact, if anything, it is exactly because we don't engage with the unions in Britain that they are more conflictual. It is exactly because they are not uh, co-opted at governance level or you know, any sort of meaningful negotiation that they become conflictual because this is the only, the only strategy which is left when they are not recognized as an interlocutor. Something which is important and which is uh, uh, helpful to, to European unions is to be able to have facilities and to be able to offer services to the members and even to non-members in those facilities. In many European countries, the unions is uh, the union office is a place where you go if you want to uh, do a self-assessment, if you want to do a child uh, benefits claim, if you want to do an unemployment claim, if you want to ask for your pension. Uh, so it's a place for, for broader ranges of uh, services. Now, there is also a literature on, uh, on this potential revival of uh, trade unionism in Britain. For example, this is about engaging with the young people who are technically less interested than the people generations, but equally, they, are, they should be more interested because uh, they are those uh, with facing more problems because of the contracts they, they have or because of the, the pension that they, they might have to, to face. There is literature on the, the, the possibilities of social media and new forms of communication to, to increase the, the, the impact of unions. There is uh, also literature on the potential uh, role of the new independent unions, so alternative to the incumbent unions, maybe in some niche professions, in some uh, specific sectors, this may be the case. There is also literature on an, an additional role of the union outside, strictly speaking, uh, the employment affairs. And there is uh, also the literature that is telling us that maybe the, the, the democratic uh, mechanism and the leadership selection and the, the way we appoint the branch officer should probably change to, to become more appealing to members and potential members. Overall, there is also the dilemma organizing or servicing. Is the union a place I join like the Labour Party or the Labour Party because I'm interested in uh, organizing and uh, I see the organization as a place for my fulfillment? Or is it a place I join as an insurance or to receive services? Of course, there is a combination of the two. You cannot have a union which is only organizing or only servicing. But some servicing has to be there, and maybe we can improve the, the services that they offer to, to become more, um, more, more, to have a bigger impact and also to find alternative funding mechanisms. Uh, there was also interesting articles, there were also interesting articles on the impact of the pandemic. This was uh, an occasion to, to, to reflect on the new potential role of the unions. In some European countries, the pandemic was uh, uh, an opportunity to reflect not only on the um, critical workers and the public sector, but also on the role of uh, um, the unions. Also, since 2009 in Britain in particular, there were plenty of reflections on the claimed growing irrelevance of employment relations and industrial relations. And uh, perhaps now we are at a point where we see that there, were, there is not that uh, irrelevance that we were afraid of or that we were told of in the, uh, in, the in the late 90s and at the beginning of the uh, 2000. So probably we now know that employment relations matter. We know that uh, this collective sphere, this collective understanding of employment and work is important and maybe it's not sufficiently, sufficiently represented in our teaching, in our research, in our curriculum design. We might have students leaving a business school without really knowing what is a trade union. We might even have HR professionals which have been spending so much time in activities which are not necessarily that crucial 
And maybe they've lost that professional skill, or at least that side of their professional skills that used to be uh, dealing with unions and branches and the mechanism of voice and participation. So this is potentially lost, while other European countries have always kept them because the union has never disappeared and collective bargaining has never disappeared in the past 40 years. So I wonder whether teaching wise, researching wise, and also CIPD or HR profession wise, we have to, to make sure that we are still uh, in line with what might be necessary because uh, you don't need to go to Germany to deal with, um, uh, with the works council because Germany is here with the multinationals and maybe if you are working for British multinationals operating uh, in Europe, you still have to deal with the work councils or the European work councils or with uh, anyway, uh, any other forms of uh, um, employment relations in a collective way. So this is a big uh, professional and um, HR professional and academic professional uh, question that we have to ask. The, why, why, why is the case? Because the union is a big uh, organization, a complex organization, different to uh, any other organization with this combination of political sphere, permanent structure, elected structure, um, power dynamics, uh, internal coalitions, uh, and uh, local, regional, national, uh, committees and the servicing and organizing identity. So if you don't understand the, how a union operates, you're going to, 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 to clash in a meeting because you don't know what they speak about, what jargon they use, what is their, their internal and external agenda. So uh, we need to know uh, what is a union to be able to engage uh, effectively with them. Boys involved in participation, by the way, it's not necessarily only uh, mediated by the union, but I have the impression that also here, this uh, collective form of interaction with, with, the, with, with the employees has been neglected, or we've done this often uh, as a patronizing tick boxing, tick, tick boxing exercise. So uh, HR um, should, should deal with this, but in a, in a serious, in, a, in, a, in an effective way. And again, uh, dealing with unions doesn't mean that you, you reject all the other tools typical of, uh, of a modern sophisticated HR approach to, to, uh, to managing people. So uh, there was no alternative uh, to, uh, in between the two spheres of, of dealing with our employees. The two things can be cultivated simultaneously. Going back to voice participation and involvement, uh, I don't know, I have the perception that uh, we have not done enough uh, in this. I don't need co-determination. I don't need the German, uh, the German mit bestimmung. But have we done a communication, consultation, information in a meaningful way? Have, have, uh, have, have we invested in this in a, in a professional and serious way? And um, the same applies with the participation tools. Um, uh, have we been doing enough of, the, of this? Or is it the terrible situation that Nick described uh, two weeks ago, partially the result of uh, not working enough on the, the with the tools that we got, uh, voice participation and involvement. Some of them require dealing with the union, but not not all of them. Now, I, I, an example here: yes, the works council I mentioned already, and the employee directors. But uh, even the simplest tool here, the, the simplest tool is the staff survey. Uh, we often do staff surveys which are um, which are very cheap, which are not particularly sophisticated. Or maybe we do a very sophisticated staff survey and then there is no feedback. Or maybe there is a feedback, but then there is no action right, after this feedback. So um, I have the impression that uh, HR uh, could do much better in dealing with, with voice participation involvement. Uh, and you know what, if you do, uh, if you tend to do some of those, uh, those uh, to use some of those tools, but you do them in a poor way, then it's better not to do it. Because if you if you do a poor staff survey, better better you don't do it at all. A final reflection is that the history of trade unions is linked with the history of democracy and rights in the broader sense. So, when we think about uh, restricting even further how unions operate, how industrial disputes are uh, are called. We, 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 we might have to, to think twice because this is a, a very, a very uh, important element I would like to, to raise. You know, uh, this is the case of uh, Solidarność in Poland. This was the struggle of millions of people to get uh, a free, independent trade union. And this meant uh, not only uh, bringing democracy to Poland, but this meant also 
the collapse of the Soviet Union. Solidarność made more to the collapse of the Soviet Union than the fall of the Berlin Wall. This was a crucial development. A free trade union made so much in the history of Europe. But also in the history of Britain, if you think about the Peter Lo Massacre, if you think about the, the Toll Part of Martyrs, this is a, a glorious history of uh, workers, associations, and unions that uh, were um, that meant so much more than just uh, employment rights. This is people that fought for democracy, for freedom of speech, and this is a uh, this has been the case not only in the 19th century, even uh, recently and very recently, the trade union goes together with the improvement of the quality of our democracy. And so uh, I am not sure you want to live in a country where the union is, uh, is doomed to disappear or where we are happy that the union is weak or where we are happy that the union membership is going down or where we are happy that they fail to, to be effective in the negotiation because uh, unions are much more than collective bargaining and pay deals. So much <laughs> that uh, uh, the Chinese Communist Party never made the, the old China federations of trade unions a real independent union because they know that uh, once uh, a union is there, once a free association of workers is there, where today they ask about a better pay, tomorrow they ask about a, a collective contract, the day after they ask about more, more uh, freedom of speech and democracy. So clearly there isn't a free trade union in China and in any authoritarian regime. There wasn't a free union in fascist Italy because the authoritarian regime don't like union. So we, sh we shouldn't uh, equally um, try to, uh, to constrain even further the, the, the freedom of unions. By the way, I see here that this team page, he, he, he told us in, in, in the workshop last week that even the Chinese trade, trade unions with all its uh, defects and uh, uh, being very different to the Western Tribunal. Still, uh, some research tells us that uh, even that union you know, still proves uh, effective in improving uh, the, 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 the growth and productivity of companies. Final slide. Uh, so Nick Wilton was super pessimist and we are uh, also pessimist, huh? um, but better work, better management is up to us. So the, we haven't received uh, a model from, from the sky. And so we are not doomed to follow rules and traditions that, uh, that we don't like. If we, if we realize that uh, maybe they are no longer uh, fit for purpose. We have agency to change things uh, at micro level, at more micro level, uh, rather than uh, accepting passively things that make people stress, alienated, unproductive, and ready to leave as soon as possible. We have all the tools to uh, to change things, at company level, at sector level, at national level. Of course, this requires uh, um, unions to become more modern in the sense that I described earlier, employers to not to be afraid of unions and not to be afraid of workers in general, and also the state to be willing to join the negotiations to play a positive role in acknowledging that the unions are an interlocutor and rather than running away from, uh, from disputes and negotiations. Within this, the task for each other is to deal with voice, participation, and modern industrial relations. This can be crucial crucial for the productivity of companies and in the specific also for the future of trade unions in Britain. Thank you very much for your attention. I, I, I kept this uh, shorter than the hour. So let's see if there, are, if there are any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrea. That's um, really interesting. And thank you for, for, I didn't realize I'd been quite so pessimistic when I was talking a couple of weeks ago, but um, uh, on reflection, perhaps uh, perhaps that was that was the case. Although I try to end on a slightly optimistic note. Um, uh, any questions for anyone? I've got a couple of, of thoughts and some questions. But uh, anyone else have anything they'd just like to to pick up before I jump in? Thanks very much, Nick, and thanks, Andrea, for a, a fantastic presentation. As you would probably expect, I agreed with just about all of it. Um, a couple of points I just wanted to pick up. You mentioned. Quite early in your slide, you said membership numbers are not necessarily important. I mean, I kind of think from a UK perspective, I'm not sure that's quite true. Um, in France, of course, the union density is about 10%, as you mentioned, but there's about 90% collective bargaining coverage. But in France, they have a kind of a hegemonic understanding, to use Gramsci's term, that unions are a force for good, that unions balance the power of capital. So unions don't have to justify their existence in quite the same way that they do in the UK, whereas in the UK, there's a debate about whether unions are a good thing. 
I know what you and I think, but there is a wider debate there about whether unions are a good thing or whether they have a right to a seat at the table. And I do think membership density goes some way into demonstrating that unions you know, are a collective organisation of many people and that gives them a, a, a right to a place in the conversation. Um, and the other point I wanted to make, um, you, you talked about membership numbers, but but my question is, who are union members today? Because a generation, two generations ago, they were probably the industrial working class. Uh, today, they're more likely to be public sector. Many of them are more likely to be middle class. And I'm interested in the role of the unions in giving uh, political voice to the working class. You mentioned Thomas Piketty. And Piketty's talked about uh, the political cleavage being between the merchant right, uh, the, mer yeah, the merchant right, and the Brahmin left. And the merchant right represents the uh, the middle class rich, and the merchant left, uh, the Brahmin left represents uh, the middle class educated. Um, and the middle class educated, I wonder if a lot of their political preoccupations are around cultural issues and identity politics, less than class representation. So I wondered if you felt the unions used to link the working class to left-wing parties and whether you felt that was still the case today, or it's a big question, Andrea, but how we might get back to that place today. But thanks for the presentation. Yeah, okay, if I can answer immediately. Yes, you're right about the, the membership density, you're right. Um, what I meant is that, um, yes, membership has to go up, um, but without the, the, the state and the employers association and employers recognizing that uh, collective negotiation is important, even if they magically increase by 10 million, this wouldn't be enough. But yes, it, so it is a condition, it is a prerequisite, but it's not a sufficient uh, prerequisite. Um, I agree with you that um, the Labour Party and also some of the unions has focused more on uh, identity politics rather than on some substantial uh, issues. And I think it's a mistake that alienated uh, some of the working class. And you know what? This is such a taboo topic that I'm even afraid to tell this because uh, uh, it is a very, um, um, very con uh, controversial topic in Britain. And the fact that it became a controversial topic uh, tells us that there is something wrong, that you cannot even argue uh, against this, uh, uh, that uh, you might be tagged uh, uh, with by the nicknames. Uh, so yes, I agree with both of your statements, uh, Tim. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Any other questions? Well, I'm going to launch in actually. Just, just, uh, it just. Um, I'm not sure this is really a question or a, a just an observation. Really, um, you mentioned some of the, the kind of the ways in which unions have tried to renew themselves over the last four decades or so, organising servicing models, um, uh, partnership as well, and, and and all of those sorts of things. Um, and, and from the data you showed, it suggested that, that that perhaps has played a role or some of those strategies may have played a role in still stabilising membership levels or, the, or arresting the decline in membership levels. I just wondered to what extent you thought that the current, I mean, bearing in mind some of the, the things that I talked about a couple of weeks ago in terms of the, the state of the world of work and about work intensification and so on, and whether actually the the, the opportunity for renewal really has come from the other side in the sense that things have reached such a pass in terms of the quality of working life um, that actually what might arise, you know, in terms of greater interest in joining unions, in particular amongst amongst younger workers and so on, is the fact that the real benefit of unions is what it's always been to a certain extent in terms of actually the conflict between labour and capital in the sense that people realise that the gains that can be made through organisation you know, in terms of working conditions and pay and the, the, the roots of unionism, that that perhaps that's the, the route to renewal rather than looking for slightly more sophisticated models of unionism and actually the kind of traditional role of unions in the sense of organising large numbers of people to, to resist poor working conditions. Perhaps that's the, the route and or might also explain why the government has taken the view that it's not going to engage at all uh, to a certain extent, or indeed to try to legislate against unions even further, because that is seen as a as a significant threat, I guess, to kind of in, in, in industrial peace um, and so on. So there's a whole bunch of, bunch of thoughts there, but I don't know if there's anything in there that you 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 you, you have any thoughts on. Uh, you're still muted, you're muted, Andrea. 
Forgive me. I pass the, the slides on the literature too quickly to, to, to give you the opportunity to read them, but they were about um, from the past two or three years. So the, those were about the hope that from now on there will be a revival. But as you said, um, I agree what you, what you said. Basically, I agree with you that in the 90s and in the first decade of 2000, probably uh, things were going rather well here. And so there was no need to look back at uh, collective bargaining and union relations. So you're right that probably it is the, it is supremely, it is the problems now um, that we are facing that are probably an opportunity for the unions. The pandemic as well was a, was a problem and in some counties was an opportunity to rediscover the, 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 the role of the, the union. So after all, the, the British model uh, survived well uh, from the 80s because, uh, well, Britain has been a country with the highest or among the highest um, participation levels, uh, lowest uh, unemployment levels. Um, it was attracting millions of uh, workers from, uh, from abroad. Uh, it was attracting investments, uh, but this is no longer the case. So a model that was successful in those 20 years uh, and maybe is no longer successful today might need to be fine-tuned. And so the government shouldn't uh, um, refuse to make some adjustments. I don't know if probably you were not that pessimist. It was me reading your presentation <laughs> in a more pessimist uh, <laughs> and, and length. No, I think, I, think, I think my tendency is towards pessimism, I'll be honest, um, but uh, I tried to end on a slightly kind of optimistic note in the sense of actually, are we looking to, for a uh, a different model of HRM, which might be a little bit more receptive to kind of human needs rather than perceived kind of, uh, you know, um, but servicing particular kind of proxies for satisfaction. But um, I, I'm going to, um, uh, I'm not sure there's any other questions that, that have come up. Um, so I'll, I'll draw things to a close. Um, thank you to Andrea. Really interesting stuff. I think it's um, a, a really interesting, a fascinating time to be, well, a, a hugely newsworthy and important uh, subject. I think trade unionism has is, is never been so, perhaps arguably, so, so important now as it is today, given the things that uh, are happening um, and the role that unions have played historically in um, social progress and so on. Um, so thank you very much for Andrea, really, really interesting. Um,